So if you are new to this channel, I have a real quick story for you that I think will kind of better set the stage for this week's video. About two years ago now, my 17 year career in the corporate world had come to an end. And at that time, I had decided to enter into what would be a 12 month experiment into becoming a full time landscape photographer. And I documented this entire 12 month journey in a four part series that I'll link below if you're interested in checking that out. And the reason that I call this an experiment is because I gave myself a firm 12 month timeline to create real progress, to show enough momentum in order to proceed an additional 12 months. And if that momentum wasn't there, then at that time, I would just be forced to, to polish up my resume and start looking for a new job in a financial marketing space. But at least I would have given it a shot. And I wouldn't have to live with the regret of never giving full time photography and a chance to, to work for me. Now fast forward an additional 12 months. I am very happy to report that after a total of 24 months now, I am still a full-time landscape photographer and that feels absolutely tremendous to say. And now that my first two years are behind me, I can honestly say that landscape photography, it might be the most difficult genre photography to, to make a full-time living out of. So for instance, wedding photographers. A wedding photographer can always rely on people reaching out to them to photograph weddings. A portrait photographer can always rely on people reaching out to them to photograph portraits. A real estate photographer can always rely on people reaching out to them to photograph real estate. But when's the last time you heard of someone reaching out to a landscape photographer? It doesn't happen near as often. So it's a, it's a slightly different business model. And I think this next statement really sums it up the best. I personally don't know of one great landscape photographer that is not also a great educator. Now that doesn't mean that you have to become a professional teacher to make a career out of photography. I think that if you're passionate about something, then you automatically have this innate ability to translate that passion into value for someone else. And I think that's what it's all about. It's all about creating value for others. And in this video, I want to share with you kind of the mistakes that I made in my first two years, what worked for me, what didn't work for me, along with my specific financial results, and just the real truth behind becoming a full-time landscape photographer in hopes that this could help motivate some folks that are possibly on the fence as to whether or not a career in photography is right for them. Now, much like all of my videos, I'd like to keep them very organized and very fluid. So I broke this one down into three parts that I simply call the boat, the oars, and the anchor. So to jump right into it, I'm going for this whole kind of like nautical theme on this week's video, but to jump right into the boat section, I look at this as kind of the foundation of what I'm trying to build. The boat cannot move by itself. All the boat does is float. And when I first started out on this, uh, my 12 month experiment, I, I think I looked at revenue or income a little bit differently. I looked at it as what, what are the things that I can sell always be closing to start generating money because I was so fixated on, I got to generate money in order to make this work. And that's very important, of course, but I think shifting your mindset a little bit more towards how do I create value? And I ask myself this almost every single day now, how am I going to provide value for others today? And I ask myself that constantly. And it's a good reminder as to not get so fixated on what am I going to sell to generate money? Because I think if you focus on the value, the money will come. So something that took me a little while to really put enough emphasis on is my website. And I cannot overstate the importance of a website. I looked at a website initially as just a place to store my portfolio. And it has become so much more than that. Your website really becomes kind of your headquarters. Yes, you can distribute products. You can sell products to your website, but you most importantly, you distribute value to other people via your website. So it's tremendously important. And here's a, 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 good, a good graph of my first 12 months. So 2018 to 2019, this is the, uh, the number of unique visitors that visited my website, 18 and a half thousand. And right around here is when I really started to focus on my website heavily. So 18 and a half thousand unique visitors in my first year. In my second year, that number has risen to 50, almost 59,000 visitors. And you can see that it continues to go up. So focusing on your website, I think that it, you, you, you can't focus on it too much. Honestly, there's just a lot of power in, 
and really cultivating what you want to distribute via your website. So things like blogs. And I know when you hear a blog article or when you hear writing a blog, that seems like a ton of work and you might think you're not a great writer. Well, honestly, I, I don't think I'm a great writer either. And I don't write a lot of blogs. I write one blog at the end of every month and I post it on my website, but I'm very consistent with it. And still to this day, now if you actually just Google the generic term landscape photography blog, I, my blog is the very first one that pops up, which is absolutely crazy to me. But being consistent with the blog and just creating more value has driven more people to my website, which is evident by this chart. And I think that's that that's a, a good representation of just creating that value for others. You create the value, the people will come. Um, an email subscriber list, I think is imperative for someone who's looking to get into photography. It's one of the number one regrets that I hear new businesses speak about is that they didn't start an email subscriber list soon enough. And starting an email subscriber list is just another great way to connect with people. You know, you provide some type of free value to them. Maybe it's an ebook you wrote, or maybe it's an article that you wrote, or maybe it's a video you wrote. And people will ask you to send that to them. And of course, they give you their email address in order to do that. And an email address is a very powerful thing. It means a, it means a lot to someone to give you their email address. So starting an email subscriber list, and I did it through a monthly newsletter, and here is the growth of my monthly newsletter subscribers. May of 2019, about one and a half thousand. In about April 2020, it's actually, I'm not sure why it's not showing this, but it's over 6,000 uh, subscribers right now. So that growth has been exponential in a relatively short amount of time. And once again, you know, I don't get paid for any of that. None of those things generate direct income for me but it all creates value for others. And I think that's one of the most important things for someone to focus on that is trying to get start a career in landscape photography is focus on the value for others first and everything else will come together. Now, as far as the oars go, I, I call the oars, these are revenue streams. So these are the things that move the boat. And each oar in the water is a different revenue stream. And this is something that was really difficult my first year was that trying to determine exactly what revenue streams work the best. And I was so used to, or I was so conditioned from my career in the corporate world, 17 years of only having one revenue stream. So when I became a photographer, I immediately knew that all my income was not going to come from one single source. I would have to branch out to have multiple different revenue streams, but trying to determine what revenue streams work for you, it's a time consuming process. You're not going to figure out in a couple of weeks. It took me the better part of my first year. And what's difficult about it is what works for you might not work for me. What works for me might not work for you, but I had to end up going through and trying to cultivate a lot of revenue streams that didn't materialize for me. But I'm happy to say that I now have the number dwindled down, I think from 13 or 14 different revenue streams to a solid seven revenue streams that all contribute uh, measurable income for myself. Now for a frame of reference in, my first year, in my first 12 months, I generated $14,037. And I know that is not very much, that's not a lot of money for an entire year's worth of work. But the, the encouraging part of that was the majority of that $14,000 all came in the last three months of, uh, of that year. So that was really the momentum that gave me the drive to continue this experiment for one more year. Now, I guess the way that I broke this down is that I broke it down by the revenue channels that are generating the least amount of money, the least overall percentage of my overall income for the next 12 months. So coming in at the very bottom, and this is kind of a shocker, generating only 1.5% of my total income in the last 12 months is print sales. Print sales I find to be very difficult. I don't give it the attention that it deserves. And I know I've mentioned this in other videos as well, that I don't market it a whole lot and I don't focus on it a whole lot, mainly because it's not generating me a lot of money. So I kind of have to focus my attention elsewhere. But print sales are still not generating a lot of money. Like I said, 1.5% of my total income. Now coming in at the, the second lowest is one-to-one -one sessions. Now, if you watched any of the previous videos in this series, one-to-one -one sessions actually used to be called post-processing sessions. And those are Skype virtual sessions where we, I used to get online with someone and they would you know, pay for either a one hour or a two hour package and we would edit photos together. 
those kind of post-processing sessions have now turned into kind of like one-to-one, -one, just kind of generalized consultation sessions where we talk about post-processing um, on-field or in-field location tips or best practices. We talk about setting up a photography business, setting up a website. They've really morphed into anything. So I changed the name from post-processing sessions to one-to-one -one sessions because I felt that that was a little bit more fitting. But those are generating a total of 4% of my total income right now. And coming at third is partnership content, which is generating a total of 10% of my total income. And what partnership um, content is, is working with additional brands that focus on outdoor photography. So I have been working with Visual Wilderness, creating visual tutorials for their website. And when people purchase those tutorials, I get a portion of those proceeds. I also write blog articles for them as well. So those are all things that are generating income. And I haven't mentioned this yet, but I do have another partnership that I'm entering into with Outdoor Photography Guide, which is another outdoor photography related uh, website. And much like Visual Wilderness, creating short videos for their uh, premium uh, subscriber base, where they are uh, just talking about all things related to landscape photography. So partnership content generated a total of 10% of my income last year. Now, coming in that's slightly higher was workshops at 10.5% of my total income. I haven't done a whole lot of workshops. I didn't do any my first year. My second year, I did two. I taught at the Out of Oregon Landscape Photography Conference, and I also ta taught at the most recent Out of Chicago Live uh, Virtual Landscape Photography Summit, which was a ton of fun, and that totaled a, a um, total of 10.5% of my overall income there. And I'm planning on teaching, of course, a lot more workshops in the, uh, in the third 12-month cycle moving forward. Now, coming in at 13%, is YouTube sponsorships. So I've done three sponsorships now. I've done them, of course, with Squarespace. You've see those, uh, seen those before. Uh, I've done a, sponsor, a sponsored collaboration video with Nissy Filters. I also done one with Skillshare. So YouTube sponsorship has uh, contributed to a total of 13% of my overall income for the second 12 month cycle. Now also coming in at 13% is affiliate marketing. So these are, are used to be things mostly like Amazon affiliate, where if you click on the link at the bottom in the description of a YouTube video and you purchase a product, the, the, the link will generate a small commission for that, uh, for that person. So it doesn't cost any more for you, but it creates a tiny bit of commission for me that uh, you know it, it, it slowly adds up over time. But I'm, I'm now a affiliate with Amazon, with Adorama, b and and Moment. So kind of diversifying the different types of, affili of affiliate networks. Just that way I'm not hinged solely on Amazon because if you pay attention to that kind of stuff, Amazon just slashed the amount of uh, affiliate revenue or affiliate commissions that they were paying people. So diversification with affiliate marketing is very, very critical. Now, coming in at 48%, Almost half of my income for the second 12 month cycle has come from, from you all, the, the YouTube ad revenue. And I am super, super gracious for the, uh, for the momentum that I've been able to, uh, to create on YouTube over the last two years. And um, like I mentioned, YouTube ad revenue came in at, at 48% exactly. And here's a, another interesting chart here. This is the first 12 month cycle that um, my uh, YouTube channel had. So 1.2 million views the first 12 months, generating $4,700. And here is the second 12 months, 3.8 million views, generating a total of t just over $24,000. So that is a substantial increase from here. My views went up three times but my revenue actually went up five times. So that's a, that's a big jump in the, in the second year. And all of that totaled a grand total of $49,482. That's the exact dollar amount that I made in my second year as a full-time landscape photographer. And that represents over a 350% increase over my first year as a full-time landscape photographer. So that was absolutely tremendous. Very exciting to see. I cannot wait to see what the next three or next 12 month cycle or my third year has in store. So I'm really looking forward to, to kind of growing and expanding everything. So those are kind of the things that have worked for me. Now the things that have not worked for me, I call these things the anchors. These are the things that are stopping my boat from moving or, or things that are slowing the boat down. So things like stock photography. I had mentioned earlier about when you first start out, you have to try and figure out what revenue channels work for you. Stock photography is something that I spent a solid six to eight months on trying to get that to work for me. 
it never materialized for me. So that's something that I wish I, I really never would have worked on or spent as much time focusing on, but it's one of those things you don't know it until you try. Uh, the other thing that was kind of an anchor was that I looked at social media as a revenue stream. Now, I don't consider YouTube social media. I consider social media things like Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And when I first started out, I tried to figure out a way to, to make money off of those platforms. And I never made one penny off of any of them. But I now look at social media as a little bit different, as a way to kind of distribute things, distribute value that I'm trying to create. So if I create a new blog article, I'll post it on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram to notify people that I posted a new blog article. Or if I send out my monthly newsletter, I'll post something on those various social media platforms just notifying people that, hey, my new newsletter just went out. If you're not signed up, you can sign up for it. Shameless plug above here. <laughs> and so just using social media is a means to kind of just promote other things, drive traffic elsewhere is the, kind of the way that I look at it now. And last and certainly not least is probably the thing that I spent the most time on that generated the least amount of money, which is $0. And it's reaching out to tourism boards. I spent a ton of time basically cold calling and emailing tourism boards all over the world trying to solicit my work to them in hopes that they might you know, purchase some type of service for me on some type of upcoming campaign that they were going to be running for their, their local area. And they might hire me to go take those photos or create video content for them. Spent a ton of time doing it. I didn't generate anything. So those were kind of the three anchors that I felt were kind of slowing my boat down. If I could do things over, I wouldn't have focused the way I focused on any of those three things because it would have freed up a lot of time for me in my very first year. So that is what worked for me. That's what didn't work for me. And that's kind of my second year update from a financial perspective as to what revenue streams we're creating, what proportion of my overall income in the second year. And if you're looking to get into photography, I really hope this video can maybe steer you in the right direction or help give you the motivation to, to definitely try because it is absolutely possible to become a full-time lands landscape photographer in 2020 and beyond. You just kind of have to kind of look at it a little bit differently than other genres of photography, but it's absolutely possible. So I do hope you enjoyed this week's video. As always, if you did enjoy it, if you could give it that thumbs up, definitely helps the channel perform better. Subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already and ring the little bell notification too. There's some new um, YouTube analytics that I was looking at and I, I never mentioned the bell in any of my videos before. I think that was the first time, but um, yeah, if, uh, if you wanna be notified whenever I do upload it, you can ring the bell notification and that'll uh, make sure that you are automatically notified as soon as a video goes live. So um, as always, I really do appreciate you watching this week's video and I will see you all next week. Bye.